Chapter 80 of Women in History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July 2012. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 80. Mrs. Grant. Born 1755. Died 1838. Professor Craig. The late excellent Mrs. Grant of Lagan, as she used to be designated to the end of her long life, from the parish of Invernessshire, of which her husband had been clergyman, and with which her first publications were connected, affords another remarkable example, both of the successful cultivation of literature by a woman in trying or unusual circumstances, and of the attainment thereby of many worldly, in addition to higher, advantages. She has herself told us the story of her early life and her first struggles, in an unfinished memoir which has been published since her death. In the mere acquisition of knowledge she had no peculiar difficulties to encounter, either from circumstances or any deficiency in herself. On the contrary, her faculties were quick and early developed, and her opportunities, though not affording her a regular education, were well suited to nourish and strengthen those tendencies and powers which chiefly gave her mind its distinctive character. I began to live, she observes, to the purposes of feeling, observation, and recollection much earlier than children usually do. I was not acute, I was not sagacious, but I had an active imagination and uncommon powers of memory. I had no companion, no one fondled or caressed me, far less did any one take the trouble of amusing me. I did not, till I was six years of age, possess a single toy. A child with less activity of mind would have become torpid under the same circumstances. Yet whatever of purity of thought, originality of character, and premature thirst for knowledge distinguished me from other children of my age was, I am persuaded, very much owing to these privations. Never was a human being less improved in the sense in which that expression is generally understood, but never was one less spoiled by indulgence or more carefully preserved from every species of mental contagion. The result of the peculiar circumstances in which I was placed had the effect of making me a kind of anomaly very different from other people, and very little influenced by the motives, as well as very ignorant of the modes of thinking and acting prevalent in the world at large. It was this anomalous character in her case, happily free from any kind of grotesqueness or absurdity, and allied to everything virtuous and noble, that both directed her to literature and authorship in the first instance, and gave much of its interest to what she wrote. Annie McIver, Mrs. Grant's maiden name, the daughter of Duncan McIver, a plain, brave, pious man, having been taken by her parents to America, returned to Scotland, and married in 1779 Mr. Grant, a chaplain at Fort Augustus in Invernessshire. She acquired a taste for farming, led a life of fervid activity, and had a large family of children, all promising, and the greater number of them beautiful. It would have been strange indeed if her literary aspirations had sprung out of the domestic habits of the mother of a large family and the manager of a farm. But we are told by herself that she had begun to scrawl a kind of Miltonic verse when she was little more than nine years old. She had early written off many scraps of poetry and distributed them among her friends, who had taken care to preserve them, while Mrs. Grant had retained no copies. It was by a kind of amicable conspiracy that these friends set about the good work of collecting and publishing these pieces, in such a way as would secure pecuniary relief to the author. The subscriptions amounted to three thousand names, and the original poems, with some translations from the Gaelic, appeared in 1803. Some years afterwards came her Letters from the Mountains, which not only claimed the attention of the reading world, but inspired so much love and respect for the quiet virtues and literary abilities of the author, that many who knew her, and some who did not, contributed to help her in her hard struggle with the world. But Mrs. Grant's life was destined to be a passage through storm and sunshine. Her husband died, and her children, inheriting his tendency to decline, fell off one by one, so that every year brought her fresh trouble, yet still with a noble spirit that enabled her to surmount her afflictions by something like philosophy. In 1811 she published her Essays on the Superstitions of the Highlands of Scotland, 
with translations from the Gaelic, in two volumes, and subsequently a poem entitled 1813, which excited little attention. Mrs. Grant's life for some years after she gave up writing for the public had been in part devoted to an intellectual employment of another kind, the superintendence of the education of a succession of young persons of her own sex who were sent to reside with her. From the year 1826 also, her means had been further increased by a pension of one hundred pounds, which was granted to her by George the Fourth, on a representation drawn up by Sir Walter Scott, and supported by Henry Mackenzie, Lord Jeffrey, and other distinguished persons among her friends in Edinburgh. During the period of nearly thirty years that she resided there, she was a principal figure in the best and most intellectual society of the Scottish metropolis, and to the last her literary celebrity made her an object of curiosity and attraction to strangers from all parts of the world. Even after the loss of the last of her daughters, her correspondence testifies that she still took a lively interest in everything that went on around her. With all its increasing infirmities, she says, and even with the accumulated sorrows of my peculiar lot, I do not find age so dark and unlovely as the Celtic bard seems to consider it. However imperfectly my labor has been performed, we may consider it nearly concluded, and even though my cup of sorrow has been brimful, the bitter ingredient of shame has not mingled with it. On all those who were near and dear to me, I can look back with approbation, and may tenderly cherish unspotted memories." fond recollections, and the hopes that terminate not here. I feel myself certainly not landed, but in a harbour from whence I am not likely to be blown out by new tempests. Even after this, she was destined to receive another severe shock from the death in April 1837, in her twenty-eighth year, of her daughter-in-law, who had been married only three years, and to whom she was strongly attached. Still her courageous heart bore her up, and the zest with which she enjoyed intellectual pleasures continued almost as keen as ever. End of chapter 80「Chapter 81 of Women of History – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July 2012 Women of History by Anonymous Chapter 81 Elizabeth Inchbald Born 1756, died 1821 Cunningham The daughter of a small farmer in Suffolk, of the name of Simpson. Having lost her father in her infancy, she was left under the care of her mother, who continued to manage the farm, and in the pleasant seclusion of this cottage home, Miss Simpson was presented with abundant opportunities of gratifying her literary propensities. So sensibly had her imagination been wrought upon by the tales of fictitious grief and happiness she had met with in the course of her desultory reading, that she formed the romantic resolution of visiting the metropolis, the scene of many of the stories which had so powerfully excited her sympathies. This intention did not, as may be supposed, meet with the approbation of her friends, but so fixed was her determination to accomplish a tout prix, the object she had in view, that she seized an opportunity of eloping from her home entirely without the knowledge of her family. Early one morning in February 1772, she left Stanningfield for London, and with a few necessary articles of apparel packed in a bandbox, walked, or rather ran, a distance of two miles to the place from which the coach set out for the metropolis. This step in a girl of sixteen years of age did not augur very favorably of her future conduct or respectability, but the subsequent tenor of her life affords additional proof that very admirable results will often arise out of indifferent and even reprehensible beginnings. On her arrival at London she sought a distant relation who lived in the Strand, but on reaching the house was, to her great mortification, informed that she had retired from business and was settled in North Wales. It was near ten o'clock at night, and her distress at this disappointment moved the compassion of the people of whom she had made her inquiries, who kindly accommodated her with a lodging. This civility, however, awakened her suspicions. She had read in Clarissa Harlow of various modes of seduction practiced in London and feared that similar intentions were being meditated against her. 
A short time after her arrival, therefore, observing that she had awakened their curiosity, our young heroine seized her bandbox, and, without uttering a single word, rushed out of the house, and left them to their conjectures that she was either a maniac or an impostor. Her necessities drove her to the stage, where she met with considerable success, and performed principal characters when she was only eighteen years of age. After a residence of four years in Edinburgh, with her husband, Mr. Inchbald, also an actor of some celebrity, she returned to London, where she acted for several years at Covent Garden. Soon after, she became an authoress. Her first piece, the comedy entitled I'll Tell You What, was at first rejected by Coleman of Haymarket, but finally approved and brought out with considerable success in 1785. In 1789 she retired from the stage and devoted herself from that time entirely to literature. She wrote a number of popular dramatic pieces and edited a new edition of the British Theatre and other dramatic collections, but it is to her two novels, Nature and Art and The Simple Story, that she chiefly owes her reputation. She died at Kensington in 1821. The mind of this authoress had an original cast, and her literary style was peculiar, terse, pointed, and impressive. By exemplary industry and prudence she had raised herself into a state of comfortable independence, but she had a liberal heart, and deprived herself of many enjoyments in order to provide for relations who stood in need of her assistance. She was animated, cheerful, and intelligent in conversation, and her remarks were not taken on trust, but were the effects of acute penetration. She was very handsome in youth, and retained much of her beauty and elegance till her death. End of chapter 81Chapter 82 of The Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 82 Elizabeth Hamilton. Born 1758, died 1816. Miss, or as she latterly chose to style herself, Mrs. Elizabeth Hamilton, is one of the female writers of what may now be called the last age, whose eruption into literature was about as spontaneous and irregular as well as could be, for there was nothing either in the education she received or in the circumstances of her position to give her any peculiar impulse towards such a career yet she may be said to have registered her name there among the classics of our language if everything else she produced be forgotten as may almost be said to be already the case her cottages of glenburnie at least will live and continue to be read so long as the scottish dialect remains intelligible it is the only work written in that dialect between the era of the poetry of burns and that of the prose of scott which is now remembered of Scottish prose writing, there is no earlier subsisting example until we go back to the sixteenth century. Here it claims the honour of having been the only modern predecessor of the Waverley novels, if not that of having been, in some degree, their model. In so far as its interests and humour lie in the use of the popular dialect, it is probably to be accounted the offspring of Miss Edgeworth's castle rackrent which is the earliest work still surviving in which the comedy and expressiveness to be found in the peculiarities of the irish provincial speech were highly taken advantage of footnote born in ireland about the middle of the last century yet of scotch descent miss hamilton while yet young came to scotland where residing with relations she went through many changes of life she wrote a great many books both on religious and political subjects some of which changed without retaining attention, but it was otherwise with the cottages of Glenburnie. End quote. This work was begun, we are told, merely as the amusement of an idle hour. She was encouraged to proceed with it, and to extend the plan, by the mirth which the first sheets of it excited, when she read them to a few friends collected at her own fireside. It was not, her biographer further informs us, without considerable distrust on the part of the publisher, that it was committed to the press. 
is it indeed the unhappy instinct of publishers to be thus always blindest to the value before they come out of the books that succeed the best or is it thought expedient for the sake of making the better story that every instance of remarkably successful publication should be set off by being made to fall out contrary to expectation however that may be the success of the present work was immediate and decided it was universally read in scotland and very generally even in england where its humour could less be appreciated the great demand soon induced the publishers to print a cheap edition and in the native country of the writer it was to be seen in the hands of all classes miss benger relates that in stirlingshire a person named isabel irvine who had been miss hamilton's attendant when she was at school there some thirty or forty years before and to whom we suppose a copy had been sent by the authoress made money by lending it out among her neighbours it is believed too not to have been without effect in making the peasantry ashamed of the indolence and slovenliness which is exposed and ridiculed quote, perhaps few books end quote, observes a friend and countryman of miss hamilton's in a sketch of her character and her literary and other services to her country which miss benger has printed quote, have been more extensively useful the peculiar humour of this work by irritating our national pride has produced a wonderful spirit of improvement the cheap edition is to be found in every village library and mrs mcclarty's example has provoked many a scotch housewife into cleanliness and good order End quote. miss benger thus describes miss hamilton's ordinary mode of life after she took up her residence in edinburgh quote, the morning whenever her infirmities admitted was devoted to study at two o'clock she descended to the drawing-room where she commonly found some intimate friend ready to receive her if no engagement intervened the interval from seven till ten was occupied with some interesting book which according to a good aunt marshall's rule was read aloud for the benefit of the whole party on monday she deviated from the general system by admitting visitors all the morning and such was the esteem for her character and such the relish for her society that this private levy was attended by the most brilliant persons in edinburgh and commonly protracted till a late hour but it was in the hearts of inglenock by her own fireside when the world was shut out and its cares and conflicts and pretensions consigned to temporary oblivion that mrs hamilton was most truly known and most perfectly enjoyed of anecdote she was inexhaustible and in narrative she dramatized with such effect that she almost personated those whom she described End quote. Quote, all who had the happiness to know this amiable woman End quote, said miss edgeworth in a tribute to her memory which she contributed to an irish paper soon after mrs hamilton's death quote, will with one accord bear testimony to the truth of that feeling of affection which her benevolence kindness and cheerfulness of temper inspired she thought so little of herself so much of others that it was impossible she could superior as she was excite envy she put everybody at ease in her company and in good humour and good spirits with themselves so far from being a restraint on the young and lively she encouraged by her sympathy their openness and gaiety she never flattered but she always formed the most favourable opinion that truth and good sense would permit of every individual who came near her instead therefore of fearing and shunning her reputation all loved and courted her society End quote. she died on the twenty third of july eighteen sixteen in the sixtieth year of her age End of chapter 82 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 31st of October, 2012section 83 of women of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by pamela krantz women of history by anonymous countess de vimiero 1760 sismondi 
the academy of sciences in portugal having proposed a prize for the best portuguese tragedy on the thirteenth of may seventeen eighty eight conferred the laurel crown on osmia a tragedy which proved to be the production of a lady the countess de vemiro on opening the sealed envelope accompanying the piece which usually conveys the name of the author there was found only a direction in case osmia should prove successful to devote the proceeds to the cultivation of olives a species of fruit from which portugal might derive great advantages it was with some difficulty that the name of the modest writer of this work published in seventeen ninety five in quarto was made known to the world Buderweck has erroneously attributed it to another lady very justly celebrated in portugal caterina de Sousa, the same who singly ventured to oppose the violence of the marquis de pombal whose son she refused in marriage from the family of this illustrious lady i learned that the tragedy of osmia was not really the production of her pen in this line of composition so rarely attempted by female genius the countess de vemiero displays a singular purity of taste an exquisite delicacy of feeling and an interest derived rather from passion than from circumstances qualities indeed which more particularly distinguish her sex in the catastrophe as well as in the rest of the piece the countess de vemiero appears to have studied the laws of the french theatre and in the vivacity of her dialogue voltaire rather than corneille or racine would seem to have been kept in view the whole is composed in iambic verse free from rhyme and we are perhaps justified in asserting that this tragedy is the only one which the portuguese theatre can properly be said to possess end of countess de vemiero recording by pamela Krantz. Section 84 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Women of History by Anonymous. Joanna Bailey. Born 1762, died 1851. Professor Spalding. The daughter of a parish minister in Bothwell, in Lanarkshire. Her mother was sister of John and William Hunter, the famous anatomists. Her life was spent in domestic privacy, and marked by no events more important than the appearance of her successive works. Her brother, who became Sir Matthew Bailey, having settled as physician in London, Miss Bailey removed thither at an early age. She resided in the metropolis or its neighborhood almost constantly and died at Hampstead in February 1851. Her first volume of dramas was published in 1798. Their design, as to which it is not too much to say that the works were good in spite of it, not by means of it, was indicated in the title. A series of plays in which it is attempted to delineate the stronger passions of the mind, each passion being the subject of a tragedy and a comedy, a second volume of the plays of the passions appeared in eighteen o two and a third in eighteen twelve the tragedies are fine poems noble in sentiment and classical and vigorous in language but they were not fit for the stage and de Maufat itself was with difficulty supported for a while by the acting of john kemble and mrs siddons the tragedy of the family legend not contained in the series was acted in edinburgh in eighteen o nine after a visit the poetess had paid to sir walter scott in eighteen thirty six she published another series of plays of the passions of which henriquez and the separation the former a very striking piece were attempted on the stage some of miss bailey's small pieces were exceedingly good End of Joanna Bailey. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Chapter 85 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women of History by Anonymous Chapter 85 Born 1763, died 1814 Alison Few persons in that elevated rank have undergone such varieties of fortune as Josephine, first wife of Napoleon, and fewer still have borne so well the ordeal both of prosperity and adversity. Born in the middle class of society, she was the wife of a respectable but obscure officer. The revolution afterward threw her into a dungeon, where she was saved from a scaffold only by the fall of Robespierre. The hand of Napoleon made her successively the partner of every rank, from the general staff to the emperor's throne, and the same connection consigned her, at the very highest point of her elevation, to degradation and seclusion, the loss of her consequence, separation from her husband, the sacrifice of her affections. Stripped of her influence, cast down from her rank, wounded in her feelings, the divorced empress found the calamity felt in any rank of being childless, the envenomed dart which pierced her to the heart. It was no common character which could pass through such marvellous changes of fortune unmarked by any decided stain, unsullied by any tears of suffering. If, during the confusion of all moral ideas, consequent on the first triumphs of the revolution, her reputation did not escape the breath of scandal, and if the favourite of Paris occasioned, even when the wife of Napoleon, some frightful fits of jealousy in her husband. She maintained an exemplary decorum when seated on the consular and imperial throne, and communicated a degree of elegance to the court of the Tuileries, which could hardly have been expected after the confusion of ranks and ruin of the old nobility which had preceded her elevation. Passionately fond of dress and often blamably extravagant in that particular, she occasioned no small embarrassment to the treasury by her expenditure, but this weakness was forgiven in the recollection of its necessity to compensate the inequality of their years, in the amiable use which she made of her possessions, the grace of her manner, and the alacrity with which she was ever ready to exert her influence with her husband to plead the cause of suffering, or avert the punishment of innocence. Though little inclined to yield in general to a female persuasion, Napoleon both loved and felt the sway of this amiable character, and often in his sternest fits he was weaned from violent measures by her influence. Her influence over him was evinced in the most conclusive manner by the ascendant which she maintained after their separation from each other. The divorce and marriage of Marie-Louise produced no estrangement between them. In her retirement at Malmaison, she was frequently visited and consulted by the emperor. They corresponded to the last moment of her life, and the fidelity by which she adhered to him in his misfortunes won the esteem of his conquerors, as it must command the respect of all succeeding ages of the world. End of chapter 85。Chapter 86 of Women of History。this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jenny bradshaw women of history by anonymous chapter 86 anne radcliffe born 1764 died 1823 edinburgh review born in 1764 died in 1823 this lady was as truly an inventor, a great and original writer in the department she had struck out for herself, whether that department was of the highest kind or not, as the Richardsons, Fieldings, or Smollett's whom she succeeded, and for a time threw into the shade, or the Ariosto of the North before whom her own star has paled its ineffectual fires. The passion of fear, the latent sense of supernatural awe and curiosity concerning whatever is hidden and mysterious, these were themes and sources of interest which, prior to the appearance of her tales, could scarcely be said to have been touched upon. The castle of Otranto was too obviously a mere caprice of imagination. 
its gigantic helmets, its pictures descending from their frames, its spectral figures dilating themselves in the moonlight to the height of the castle battlements, if they did not border on the ludicrous, no more impress the mind with any feeling of awe than the enchantments and talismans, the genii and peeries of the Arabian Nights. A nearer approach to the proper tone of feeling was made in the old English baron, but while it must be admitted that Mrs. Radcliffe's principle of composition was to a certain degree anticipated in that clever production, nothing can illustrate more strongly the superiority of her powers, the more poetical character of her mind, than a comparison of the way in which in her different works the principle is wrought out, the comparative boldness and rudeness of Clara Reeve's mode of exciting superstitious emotions, as contrasted with the profound art, the multiplied resources, the dexterous display and concealment, the careful study of that class of emotions on which she was to operate, which Mrs. Radcliffe displays in her supernatural machinery. Certainly never before or since did any one more accurately perceive the point to which imagination might be wrought up by a series of hints, glimpses, or half-hearted sounds, consistently at the same time with pleasurable emotion, and with the continuance of that very state of curiosity and awe which had been thus excited. The clang of a distant door, a footfall on the stair, a half-effaced stain of blood, a stream of music floating over a wood or round some decaying chateau, nay, a very rat behind the arras, become in her hands, invested with a mysterious dignity, so finely has the mind been attuned to sympathise with the terrors of the sufferer by a train of minute details and artful contrasts, in which all sights and sounds combine to awaken and render the feeling more intense. Yet her art is more visible in what she conceals than in what she displays. One shade the more, one ray the less, would have left the picture in darkness. But to let in any farther, the garish light of day upon her mysteries, would have shown at once the hollowness and meanness of the puppet which alarmed us, and have broken the spell beyond the power of reclasping it. Hence, up to the moment when she chooses to do so herself by those fatal explanations for which no reader will ever forgive her, she never loses her hold on the mind. The very economy with which she avails herself of the talisman of terror preserves its power to the last undiminished, if not increased. She merely hints at some fearful thought, and leaves the excited fancy, surrounded by night and silence, to give it colour and form. Of all the passions, that of fear is the only one which Mrs. Radcliffe can be properly said to have painted. More wearisome beings than her heroines, and anything more tolerable and not to be endured than her love tales, Calprenade or Scuderi never invented. As little have the sterner passions of jealousy or hatred, or the dark shades of envious and malignant feeling, formed the subjects of her analysis. Within the circle of these passions, indeed, she did not feel that she could walk with security, but her quick perception showed where there was still an opening in a region of obscurity and twilight as yet all but untrodden. To that, as to the sphere pointed out to her by nature, she at once addressed herself. From that, as from a central point, she surveyed the provinces of passion and imagination, and was content if, without venturing into their labyrinths, she could render their leading and more palpable features available to set off and to brighten by their variety the solemnity and gloom of the department which she had chosen end of chapter eighty six recording by jenny bradshaw chapter eighty seven of women of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Bradshaw Women of History by Anonymous Chapter 87 Miss Edgeworth Born 1767, died 1849, Geoffrey Miss Edgeworth is the great modern mistress in the useful school of true philosophy and has eclipsed, we think, the fame of all her predecessors. By her many excellent tracts on education, she has conferred a benefit on the whole mass of the population, and discharged with exemplary patience as well as extraordinary judgment, a task which superficial spirits may perhaps mistake for an humble and easy one. 
by her popular tales she has rendered an invaluable service to the middling and lower classes of the people and by her novels has made a great and meritorious effort to promote the happiness and respectability of the higher classes there are two great sources of unhappiness to those whom fortune and nature seem to have placed above the reach of ordinary miseries the one is ennui that stagnation of life and feeling which results from the absence of all motives to exertion and by which the justice of providence has so fully compensated the partiality of fortune that it may be fairly doubted whether upon the whole the race of beggars is not happier than the race of lords and whether those vulgar wants that are sometimes so importunate are not in this world the chief ministers of enjoyment this is a plague that infects all indolent persons that can live on in the rank in which they were born without the necessity of working but in a free country it rarely occurs in any great degree of virulence except among those who are already at the summit of human felicity below this there is room for ambition and envy and emulation and all the feverish movements of aspiring vanity and unresisting selfishness which act as prophylactics against this more dark and deadly distemper it is the canker which corrodes the full-blown flower of human felicity the pestilence which smites at the bright hour of noon the other curse of the happy has a range more wide and indiscriminate it too tortures only the comparatively rich and fortunate but is most active among the least distinguished and abates in malignity as we ascend to the lofty regions of pure ennui this is the desire of being fashionable the restless and insatiable passion to pass for creatures a little more distinguished than we really are with the mortification of frequent failure and the humiliating consciousness of being perpetually exposed to it among those who are secure of meat clothes and fire and are thus above the chief evils of existence we do believe that this is a more prolific source of unhappiness than guilt disease or wounded affection and that more positive misery is created and more true enjoyment excluded by the eternal fretting and straining of this pitiful ambition than by all the ravages of passion the desolations of war or the accidents of mortality this may appear a strong statement but we make it deliberately and are deeply convinced of its truth the wretchedness which it produces may not be so intense but it is of much longer duration and spreads over a far wider circle it is quite dreadful indeed to think what a sweep this pest has taken among the comforts of our prosperous population to be thought fashionable that is to be thought more opulent and tasteful and on a footing of intimacy with a greater number of distinguished persons than they really are is the great and laborious pursuit of four families out of five the members of which are exempted from the necessity of daily industry these are the giant curses of fashionable life and miss edgeworth has accordingly dedicated her two best tales to the delineation of their symptoms the history of lord glenthorne is a fine picture of ennui that of almeria an instructive representation of the miseries of aspirations after fashion the moral use of these narratives therefore must consist in warning us against the first approaches of evils which can never afterwards be resisted to some readers her tales may seem to want the fairy colouring of high fancy and romantic tenderness and it is very true that they are not poetical love tales any more than they are anecdotes of scandal we have great respect for the admirers of rousseau and petrarca and we have no doubt that miss edgeworth has great respect for them but the world both high and low which she is labouring to mend have no sympathy with this respect they laugh at these things and do not understand them and therefore the solid sense which she possesses presses perhaps rather too closely upon them and though it permits of relief from wit and direct pathos really could not be combined with the more luxuriant ornaments of an ardent and tender imagination End of chapter eighty seven recording by jenny bradshaw chapter eighty eight of women of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine g women of history by anonymous chapter eighty eight charlotte coday born seventeen sixty eight died seventeen ninety three amid which dim fervent of kine and the world 
history specially notices one thing in the lobby of the mansion de l'intendance where busy deputies are coming and going a young lady with an aged valet taking grave graceful leave of deputy barbaroux she is of stately norman figure in her twenty-fifth year of beautiful still countenance her name is charlotte coday heretofore styled d'armance while nobility still was barbaroux has given her a note to deputy de Paris, him who once drew his sword in the effervescence apparently she will to paris on some errand Quote, she was a republican before the revolution and never wanted energy End quote. a completeness a decision is in this fair figure quote, by energy she means the spirit that will prompt one to sacrifice himself for his country End quote. what if she this fair young charlotte had emerged from her secluded stillness suddenly like a star to gleam for a moment and in a moment to be extinguished to be held in memory so bright complete was she through long centuries quitting cimmerian correlations without and the dim simmering twenty-five millions within history will look fixedly at this one fair apparition of a charlotte coday will note where the charlotte moves how the little life burns forth so radiant then vanishes swallowed of the night with barbaroux's note of introduction and slight stock of luggage we see charlotte on tuesday the ninth of july seated in the car and diligence with a place for paris none takes farewell of her wishes her good journey her father will find a line left signifying that she is gone to england that he must pardon her and forget her the drowsy diligence lumbers along amid drowsy talk of politics and praise of the mountain in which she mingles not all night all day and again all night on thursday not long before noon we are at the bridge of neuilly here is paris with her thousand black domes the goal and purpose of thy journey arrived at the inn de la providence in the rue de vieux augustins charlotte demands a room hastens to bed sleeps all afternoon and night till the morrow morning on the morrow morning she delivers her note to du Perret. it relates to certain family papers which are in the minister of the interior's hand which a nun at caen an old convent friend of charlotte's has need of which du Perret shall assist her in getting this then was charlotte's errand to paris she has finished this in the course of friday yet says nothing of returning she has seen and silently investigated several things the convention in bodily reality she has seen what a mountain is like the living physiognomy of marat she could not see he is sick at present and confined to home about eight o'clock on the saturday morning she purchases a large sheath knife in the palais royal then straight away in the place de victoria takes a hackney coach to the rue de la Collège de médecine number forty four it is the residence of the citoyen marat the citoyen marat is ill and cannot be seen which seems to disappoint her much her business is with marat then hapless beautiful charlotte hapless squalid marat from caen in the utmost west from neuchatel in the utmost east they two are drawing nigh each other they two have very strangely business together charlotte returning to her inn dispatches a short note to marat signifying that she is from caen that she desires earnestly to see him and quote, will put it in his power to do france a great service end quote. no answer charlotte writes another note still more pressing sets out with it by coach about seven in the evening herself it is yellow july evening we say the thirteenth of the month marat sits about half past seven of the clock stewing in slipper bath sore afflicted ill of revolution fever of what other malady this history had rather not name excessively sick and worn poor man with precisely eleven pence half penny in paper with slipper bath strong three-footed stool for writing on the while and a squalid washerwoman one may call her that is his civic establishment in medical school street 
thither and not elsewhere has his road led him not to the reign of brotherhood and perfect felicity yet surely on the way towards that hark a rap again a musical woman's voice refusing to be rejected it is the citoyen who would do france a service marat recognizing from within cries admit her charlotte cadet is admitted Quote, citoyen marat i am from caen the seat of rebellion and wish to speak with you be seated mon enfant now what are the traitors doing at caen what deputies are at caen charlotte named some deputies their heads shall fall within a fortnight croaks the eager people's friend clutching his tablets to write barbaro petit jean writes he with bare shrunk arm turning aside in the bath petit jean and louvet and charlotte has drawn her knife from the sheath plunges it with one sure stroke into the writer's heart ah moi cher ami help there no more could death choked say or shriek the helpful washerwoman running in there is no friend of the people or friend of the washerwoman left but his life with a groan gushes out indignant to the shades below on wednesday evening about half past seven o'clock from the gate of the concierge to a city all on tiptoe the fatal cart issues seated on it a fairly young creature sheathed in red smock of murderess so beautiful serene so full of life journeying towards death alone amid the world the executioners proceed to bind her feet she resists thinking it meant as an insult on a word of explanation she submits with cheerful apology as the last act all being now ready they take the neckerchief from her neck a blush of maidenly shame overspreads that fair face and neck the cheeks were still tinged with it when the executioner lifted the severed head to show it to the people it is most true says forster that he struck the cheek insultingly for i saw it with my eyes End of chapter 88 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 3rd of November, 2012Women of History by Anonymous Madame de Stael Born 1766, died 1817, Geoffrey The most powerful writer that her country has produced since the time of Voltaire and Rousseau, and the greatest writer of a woman that any time or any country has produced. Her taste, perhaps, is not quite pure, and her style is too irregular and ambitious these faults may even go deeper her passion for effect and the tone of exaggeration which it naturally produces have probably interfered occasionally with the soundness of her judgment and given a suspicious colouring to some of her representations of fact at all events they have rendered her impatient of the humbler task of completing her explanatory details or stating in their order all the premises of her reasonings she gives her history in abstracts and her theories in aphorisms and the greater part of her works in place of presenting that systematic unity from which the highest degrees of strength and beauty and clearness must ever be derived may be fairly described as a collection of striking fragments in which a great deal of repetition does by no means diminish the effect of a good deal of inconsistency in those same works however whether we consider them as fragments or as systems we do not hesitate to say that there are more of original and profound observations more new images greater sagacity combined with higher imagination and more of the true philosophy of the passions the politics and the literature of her contemporaries than in any other author we can now remember she has great eloquence on all subjects and a singular pathos in representing those bitterest agonies of the spirit in which wretchedness is aggravated by remorse 
or by regrets that partake of its character though it is difficult to resist her when she is in earnest we cannot say that we agree in all her opinions or approve of all her sentiments she overrates the importance of literature either in determining the character or affecting the happiness of mankind and she theorizes too confidently on its past and its future history on subjects like this we have not yet facts enough for so much philosophy and must be contented we fear for a long time to come to call many things accidental which it would be more satisfactory to refer to determinate causes in her estimate of the happiness and her notions of the wisdom of private life we think her both unfortunate and erroneous she makes passions and high sensibilities a great deal too indispensable and varnishes over all pictures too uniformly with the glue of an extravagant or affected enthusiasm she represents men in short as a great deal more unhappy more depraved and more energetic than they are and seems to respect them the more for it in her politics she is far more unexceptionable she is everywhere the warm friend and animated advocate of liberty and of liberal practical and philanthropic principles on these subjects we cannot blame her enthusiasm which has nothing in it vindictive or provoking and are far more inclined to envy than to reprove that sanguine and buoyant temper of mind which after all she has seen and suffered still leads her to overrate in our apprehension both the merits of past attempts at political amelioration and the chances of their success hereafter it is in that futurity we fear and in the hopes that make it present that the lovers of mankind must yet for a while console themselves for the disappointments which still seem to beset them if madame de stael however predicts with too much confidence it must be admitted that her labors have a powerful tendency to realize her predictions her writings are all full of the most animating views of the improvement of our social condition and the means by which it may be effected the most striking refutations of prevailing errors on these great subjects and the most persuasive expostulations with those who may think their interest or their honor concerned in maintaining them even they who are the least inclined to agree with her must admit that there is much to be learned from her writings and we can give them no higher praise than to say that their tendency is not only to promote the interests of philanthropy and independence but to soften rather than exasperate the prejudices to which they are opposed with our manners in society she is not quite well pleased though she is kind enough to ascribe our deficiencies to the most honorable causes in commiserating the comparative dullness of our social talk however has not this philosophic observer a little overlooked the effects of national tastes and habits and is it not conceivable at least that we who are used to it may really have as much satisfaction in our own humdrum way of seeing each other as our more sprightly neighbors in their exquisite assemblies end of madame de stael recording by pamela kranz chapter ninety of women of history this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 90. Madame de la roche Chaclin. Born 1772. Died 1857. Geoffrey. This hard-fated woman was very young and newly married when she was thrown, by the adverse circumstances of the time, into the very heart of those deplorable contests, the war in La Vendée during the first and maddest years of the French Republic, and without pretending to any other information than she could draw from her own experience, and scarcely presuming to pass any judgment upon the merits or demerits of the cause, she has made up her memoirs of a clear and dramatic description of acts in which she was a sharer, or scenes of which she was an eye-witness, and of the characters and histories of the many distinguished individuals who partook with her of their glories and sufferings. 
the irregular and undisciplined wars which it was her business to describe were naturally far more prolific of extraordinary incidents unexpected turns of fortune and striking displays of individual talent vice and virtue than the more solemn movements of national hostility where everything is in a great measure provided and foreseen and where the inflexible subordination of rank and the severe exactions of a limited duty not only take away the inducement but the opportunity for those exaltations of personal feeling and adventure which produce the most lively interest and lead to the most animating results this lady had some right in truth to be delicate and royalist beyond the ordinary standard her father the marquis de donnesson had employment about the person of the king in virtue of which he had apartments in the palace of versailles in which splendid abode madame de rochechalin was born and continued constantly to reside in the very focus of royal influence and glory till the whole of its unfortunate inhabitants were compelled to leave it by the fury of that mob which escorted them to paris in seventeen eighty nine she had like most french ladies of distinction been destined from her infancy to be the wife of monsieur de lescure a near relation of her mother and the representative of the ancient and noble family of salégu in poitou the picture of the war in which madame de rochechalin figured so prominently and in which she lost her young husband is shaded with deep horrors the convention issued the barbarous decree that the country la vendée which still continued its resistance should be desolated that the whole inhabitants should be exterminated without distinction of age or sex the habitations consumed with fire and the trees cut down by the axe a multitude of sanguinary conflicts ensued and the insurgents succeeded in resisting this desolating invasion among the slain in one of those engagements the republicans found the body of a young woman which madame de rochechalin informs us gave occasion to a number of idle reports many giving it out that it was she herself or a sister of m de rochechalin who had no sister or a new joan of arc who had kept up the spirit of the peasantry by her enthusiastic predictions the truth was that it was a body of an innocent peasant who had always lived a remarkably quiet and pious life until recently before this action when she had been seized with an irresistible desire to take part in the conflict she deserved to be a woman of history but her name has not been preserved she had discovered herself some time before to madame de la rochechalin and begged of her a shift of a peculiar fabric the night before the battle she also revealed herself to monsieur de la rochechalin asking him to give her a pair of shoes and promising to behave in such a manner on the morrow's fight that he would never think of parting with her accordingly she kept near his person through the whole of the battle and conducted herself with the most heroic bravery two or three times in the very heat of the fight she said to him no mon général you shall not get before me i shall always be closer up to the enemy even than you early in the day she was hurt pretty severely in the hand but held it up laughing to her general and said it is nothing at all in the end of the battle she was surrounded in a charge and fell fighting like a desperado there were about ten other women who took up arms madame de rochechalin says in this cause two sisters under fifteen and a tall beauty who wore the dress of an officer at the end after the loss of her husband madame de rochechalin was told that it was impossible to resist the attack that was to be made the next day and was advised to seek her safety in flight and disguise without the loss of an instant she set out accordingly with her mother on a gloomy day in december under the conduct of a drunken peasant and after being out most of the night at length obtained shelter in a dirty farmhouse from which in the course of the day she had the misery of seeing her unfortunate countrymen scattered over the whole open country chased and butchered without mercy by the republicans who now took a final vengeance for all the losses they had sustained she had long been clothed in shreds and patches and needed no disguise to conceal her quality she was sometimes hidden in the mill when the troopers came to search for fugitives in her lonely retreat and often sent in the midst of winter to herd the sheep or cattle of her faithful and compassionate host along with his raw-boned daughter while skulking about in this state of peril and desolation they had glimpses and occasional rencounters with some of their former companions 
whom similar misfortunes had driven upon similar schemes of concealment. In this wretched condition, the time of Madame de la Roche-Chacolin's confinement drew on, and after a thousand frights and disasters she was delivered of two daughters, one of whom died within a fortnight. The result at length was that Madame de Roche-Chacolin, after several struggles with pride and principle, was prevailed to repair to Nantes, to avail herself of an amnesty. End of chapter 90「Chapter ninety one of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter ninety one. Madame Recamier. Born seventeen seventy seven. Died eighteen forty nine. Davenport Adams. The daughter of M. Bernard, a notary of Lyon, born in 1777 and married at fifteen to M. Recamier, a wealthy banker of forty-three. She was a beauty, and she knew it, the idol of that gay, irresistible French society which knows so well how to repay the devotion of its votaries. The theme of song, the goddess of La Beau Monde, very capable of love, but denied its natural exercise as wife and mother. If her path then ran among the flowers, not the less did she skirt the brink of precipice, and her friend's advice and counsel were often needed, and always welcome. She did not disdain the flatteries of her admirers. Often she encouraged them to an extent that in England would have been considered criminal, but from the testimony of impartial witnesses it seems clear that she never overstepped the bounds of virtue. She was the only woman, said Charles James Fox, who united the attractions of pleasure to those of modesty. But a woman who is always travelling on the verge of danger needs such a friend as Mathieu de Montmorency to counsel her in time. Fox was in Paris in 1802 when Madame Racamier was at the zenith of her reputation. He almost divided her with the allegiance of the gay world. The Parisian beaux imitated his costume, and the Parisian shop windows were crowded with his portraits. Between the statesman and the beauty so close an intimacy was established that scandal made busy with it. She called upon him one day to accompany her in a drive along the boulevard. "'Before you came,' said she, "'I was the fashion. "'It is a point of honour, therefore, "'that I should not seem jealous of you.' "'When sitting with her in her box at the opera, "'a copy of an ode was placed in the hands of each, "'in which Fox was panegyrized as Jupiter "'and Madame Recamier as Venus. "'The failure of M. Recamier in 1806 affected her health, "'and she went to spend the summer months of 1807 "'with Madame de Stahl at Copet. Among the illustrious residents at Geneva at the time was Prince Augustus of Prussia, a nephew of Frederick the Great, and a handsome young man of twenty-four. He fell violently in love with the Parisian beauty, who was by no means indifferent to the passion he openly displayed. He offered her his hand if she could obtain a divorce from her husband, whom half Paris, according to an old scandal, declared to be her father— Madame was not unwilling to be a princess, and she wrote to her husband, proposing a divorce. M. Recamier, in reply, expressed his willingness, but at the same time appealed to her better feelings. Years afterwards the love-suit was dropped, and the prince, instead of a wife, received her portrait. Other lovers followed, and her career came near its close. In 1849 the cholera broke out in Paris— Madame Recamier was not afraid of dying, but she shrunk from death in so terrible a form. To avoid its ravages, she removed to the Bibliothèque Nationale, but she could not escape from fate. On the 10th of May she was seized with the premonitory symptoms. On the 11th she was a corpse. She had completed nearly two and seventy years when she was removed from life by a death which of all others she most dreaded. In her time she played a conspicuous part, 
was constantly upon the gay and glittering stage. The audience applauded her loudly, and illustrious hands flung at her garlands and bouquets. Now that the applause has died out, now that the lamps burn dimly, now that the silent stage is given up to shadows, we wonder what there was in her acting to secure her so wide a fame. We look in vain for a flash of genius, for a burst of noble emotion. Vain, greedy of admiration, an arrant coquette, a somewhat frivolous intruder on the threshold of criminal passion. What was she more? A beauty? Yes, but could beauty alone have secured her so wide a repute among her contemporaries? She did not even converse brilliantly, like a du défunt or a de Stal. She did not write charming epistles, like a de Sévigné, and yet she was assiduously courted by famous wits and accomplished men of letters. Partly we may suppose her celebrity to have risen from her profession of liberal principles, under the stern regime of a Bonaparte. Partly it was owing to the tact with which she drew out the best qualities, and flattered the amour propre of her visitors. End of chapter 91《authoress of the novels Self-Control and Discipline, was the only daughter of Colonel Thomas Balfour of Elwick, and of Francis Ligonier, only daughter of Colonel Francis Ligonier, the brother of Field Marshal the Earl of Ligonier. From her sixteenth year, although her mother is spoken of as still alive at a much later date, it is stated that the entire charge of her father's household devolved upon her, and left her very little time for anything else. Thus matters continued till she was nearly twenty. Meanwhile her future husband, Dr. Brunton, and she had met, when or where we are not informed. Dr. Brunton merely says, about this time, Viscountess Wentworth, who had formerly been the wife of Mrs. Balfour's brother, the second Earl Ligonier, proposed that Mary, her goddaughter, should reside with her in London. What influence this alteration might have had on her after-life is left to be matter of conjecture. She preferred the quiet and privacy of a Scotch parsonage. We were married in her twentieth year, and went to reside at Bolton, near Haddington. A love of reading had been an early passion with her, but in her childhood it had spent itself mostly in poetry and fiction, and her want of leisure afterwards had withdrawn her to a great extent even from literature of that description. Her time, Dr. Brunton continues, was now much more at her own command. Her taste for reading returned in all its strength, and received rather a more methodical direction. Some hours of every forenoon were devoted by her to this employment, and in the evenings I was in the habit of reading aloud to her books chiefly of criticism and belles lettres. Among other subjects of her attention, the philosophy of the human mind became a favourite study with her, and she read Dr. Reed's works with uncommon pleasure. After their removal to Edinburgh their circle increased. She mingled more with those whose talents and acquirements she had respected at a distance. She had often urged me to undertake some literary work, and once she appealed to an intimate friend, who was present, whether he would not be my publisher. He consented readily, but added that he would at least as willingly publish a book of her own writing. This seemed at the time to strike her as something the possibility of which had never occurred to her before, and she asked more than once whether he was in earnest. A considerable part of the first volume of self-control was written before I knew anything of its existence. When she brought it to me, my pleasure was mingled with surprise. The beauty and correctness of the style, the acuteness of observation, and the loftiness of sentiment were, each of them in its way, beyond what even I was prepared to expect from her. The work was published in two large volumes, which were afterwards distributed into three post-octavos, in January or early in February 1811, anonymously, 
and after considerable precautions had been taken to preserve the secrecy of the authorship which actually was we are told for a little time so well kept that she had frequent opportunities of hearing her work commented on mrs brunton commenced a new novel discipline but before it was completed waverley appeared it came into her hands her husband says while she was in the country and when she had heard nothing of its reputation but she at once discerned its high merit and was so fascinated by it that she could not go to bed till she had read it through it happened that a scene of a part of her own work too was laid in the highlands about which a universal interest had been for some years before this awakened by scott's lady of the lake and other poems and her first impulse was to cancel the highland portion of her story altogether but to this sacrifice her husband strongly objected writing to one of her female friends in december a few days before her new work was to appear she says it is very unfortunate in coming after waverley by far the most splendid exhibition of talent in novel writing which has appeared since the days of fielding and smollett there seems little doubt that it comes from the pen of scott what a competitor for poor little me when discipline at length came out however its success was far greater than she anticipated but she was by no means gratified by it we are told to the same extent she had been by the reception of self-control she was now well known to be the author and therefore she was not so sure that the applause which reached her was all sincere the silence of the edinburgh and quarterly reviews too annoyed and discouraged her all this indisposed her to attempt a third novel yet she commenced some other works in which she proceeded slowly but the end of all was at hand after being married for twenty years she had at last the prospect of becoming a mother her husband's interesting narrative proceeds she was strongly impressed indeed with the belief that her confinement was to prove fatal not in vague presentiment but on grounds of which i could not entirely remove the force though i obstinately refused to join in the inference which she drew from them under this belief she completed every the most minute preparation for her great change with the same tranquillity as if she had been making arrangements for one of those short absences which only endeared her home the more to her the clothes with which she was laid in her grave had been selected by herself she herself had chosen and labelled some tokens of remembrance for her more intimate friends and the intimations of her death were sent round from a list in her own handwriting but these anticipations though so deeply fixed neither shook her fortitude nor diminished her cheerfulness they neither altered her wish to live nor the ardour with which she prepared to meet the duties of returning health if returning health were to be her portion after giving birth to a stillborn son on the seventh of december and recovering for a few days with a rapidity beyond the hopes of her medical friends she was attacked with fever it advanced with fatal violence till it closed her earthly life on the morning of saturday december nineteenth eighteen eighteen end of chapter ninety two recording by jenny bradshaw Section ninety three of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Women of History by Anonymous. Felicia Hemans. Born seventeen ninety four, died eighteen thirty five. Jeffrey the business of women being with actual or social life and the colors it receives from the conduct and dispositions of individuals they unconsciously acquire at a very early age the finest perception of characters and manners and are almost as soon instinctively schooled in the deep and dangerous learning of feeling and emotion while the very minuteness with which they make and meditate on these interesting observations and the finer shades and variations of sentiment which are thus treasured and recorded trains their whole faculties to a nicety and precision of operation which often discloses itself to advantage in their application to studies of a different character when women accordingly have turned their minds as they have done but too seldom to the exposition or arrangement of any branch of knowledge they have commonly exhibited we think a more beautiful accuracy and a more uniform and complete justness of thinking than their less discriminating brethren 
there is a finish and completeness in short about everything they put out of their hands which indicates not only an inherent taste for elegance and neatness but a habit of nice observation and singular exactness of judgment we have not as yet much female poetry that of mrs hemans is a fine exemplification it may not be the best imaginable poetry and may not indicate the very highest or most commanding genius but it embraces a great deal of that which gives the very best poetry its chief power of pleasing and would strike us perhaps as more impassioned and exalted if it were not regulated and harmonized by the most beautiful taste it is singularly sweet elegant and tender touching perhaps and contemplative rather than vehement and overpowering and not only finished throughout with an exquisite delicacy and even severity of execution but informed with a purity and loftiness of feeling and a certain sober and humble tone of indulgence and piety which must satisfy all judgments and allay the apprehensions of those who are most afraid of the passionate exaggerations of poetry almost all her poems are rich with fine descriptions and studded over with images of visible beauty but these are never idle ornaments all her pomps have a meaning and her flowers and her gems are arranged as they are said to be among eastern lovers so as to speak the language of truth or of passion this is peculiarly remarkable in some little pieces which seem at first sight to be purely descriptive but are soon found to tell upon the heart with a deep moral and pathetic impression but it is in truth nearly as conspicuous in the greater part of her productions where we scarcely meet with any striking sentiment that is not ushered in by some such symphony of external nature and scarcely a lovely picture that does not serve as an appropriate foreground to some deep or lofty emotion End of Felicia Hemans. Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 94 of Women of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Pamela Krantz Women of History by Anonymous Augustina Zaragoza Born 1786, died 1826. Allison. They were happy who, in the siege of Saragossa, expired amidst that scene of unutterable woe. Yet even they bequeathed with their last breath to the survivors the most solemn injunctions to continue to the last the unparalleled struggle and from the dens of the living and the dead issued daily crowds of warriors attenuated indeed and livid but who maintained with unconquerable resolution a desperate resistance but human nature even in its most exalted mood cannot go beyond a certain point saragossa was about to fall but like lumantia and saguntum she was to leave a name immortal in the annals of mankind such was the heroic spirit which animated the inhabitants that it inspired even the softer sex to deeds of valor amongst these augustina zaragoza was peculiarly distinguished she had served with unshaken courage a cannon near the gate of portillo at the former siege and she again took her station there when the enemy returned see general said she to palafox when he visited that quarter I am again with my old friend. Her husband being struck with a cannon-ball as he served the battery, she calmly stepped into his place, and pointed the gun as he lay bleeding at her side. Frequently she was to be seen at the head of an assaulting party, wrapped in her cloak, sword in hand, cheering on the soldiers to the discharge of their duty. She was at length taken prisoner, but being taken dangerously ill, and carried to the French hospital, she contrived to escape. A female corps was formed to carry provisions and water to the combatants, and remove the wounded, at the head of which was Dona Benita, a lady of rank. Several hundred women and children perished during the siege, not by bombs or cannon-shot, but in actual combat. 
End of section 94. Augustina Zaragoza. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Chapter 95 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Bradshaw. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter 95. Charlotte Bronte. Born 1816. Died 1855. Mrs. Gaskell. The authoress of Jane Eyre and other works is, as she calls herself, August 1850, undeveloped then and more than half a head shorter than I am, soft brown hair, not very dark, eyes very good and expressive, looking straight and open at you, of the same colour as her hair, a large mouth, the forehead square, broad, and rather overhanging. She has a very sweet voice, rather hesitates in choosing her expressions, but when chosen they seem without an effort admirable, and just befitting the occasion. There is nothing overstrained, but perfectly simple. Her nerves were severely taxed by the effort of going among strangers. On one occasion, though the number of the party could not exceed twelve, she suffered the whole day from acute headache, brought on by apprehension of the evening. It was now, 1853, two or three years since I had witnessed a similar effect produced on her, in anticipation of a quiet evening at a friend's home, and since then she had seen many and various people in London. But the physical sensations produced by shyness were still the same, and on the following day she laboured under severe headache. I had several opportunities of perceiving how this nervousness was ingrained in her constitution, and how acutely she suffered in trying to overcome it. One evening we had, among other guests, two sisters who sung Scotch ballads exquisitely. Miss Bronte had been sitting quiet and constrained till they began the bonny house of Airlie, but the effect of that and Carlyle Yetz which followed was as irresistible as the playing of the Piper of Hamelin. The beautiful clear light came into her eyes. Her lips quivered with emotion. She forgot herself, rose and crossed the room to the piano, where she asked eagerly for song after song. The sisters begged her to come and see them next morning, when they would sing as long as ever she liked, and she promised gladly and thankfully. But, on reaching the house, her courage failed. We walked some time up and down the street, she upbraiding herself all the while for her folly, and trying to dwell on the sweet echoes in her memory, rather than on the thought of a third sister who would have to be faced if we went in. But it was of no use, and dreading lest this struggle with herself might bring on one of her trying headaches, I entered at last, and made the best apology I could for her non-appearance. Much of this nervous dread of encountering strangers I ascribed to the idea of her personal ugliness, which had been strongly impressed upon her imagination early in life, and which she exaggerated to herself in a remarkable manner. I noticed, said she, that after a stranger has once looked at my face, he is careful not to let his eyes wander to that part of the room again. A more untrue idea never entered into any one's head. Two gentlemen who saw her during this visit, without knowing at the time who she was, were singularly attracted by her appearance, and this feeling of attraction towards a pleasant countenance, sweet voice, and gentle, timid manners, was so strong in one as to conquer a dislike he had previously entertained to her works. There was another circumstance that came to my knowledge at this period, which told secrets about the finely strung frame. One night I was on the point of narrating some dismal ghost story just before bedtime. She shrank from hearing it, and confessed she was superstitious, and prone at all times to the involuntary recurrence of any thoughts of ominous gloom which might have been suggested to her. She said that in first coming to us she had found a letter on her dressing-table from a friend in Yorkshire, containing a story which had impressed her vividly ever since, that it mingled with her dreams at night and made her sleep restless and unrefreshing. There was a peculiarity about Charlotte Bronte's death. Not long after her marriage with the Reverend Mr. Nichols, she was attacked by new sensations of perpetual nausea and ever-recurring faintness. A wren would have starved on what she ate during these last six weeks. Long days and long nights went by, still the same relentless nausea and faintness, and still borne on in patient trust. About the third week, in March, 1856, there was a change— 
a low wandering delirium came on and in it she begged constantly for food and even for stimulants she swallowed eagerly now but it was too late wakening for an instant from this stupor of intelligence she saw her husband's woe-worn face and caught the sound of some murmured words of prayer that god would spare her oh she whispered forth i am not going to die am i he will not separate us we have been so happy early on saturday morning march thirty one the solemn tolling of haworth church bell spoke forth the fact of her death to the villagers who had known her from a child and whose hearts shivered within them as they thought of the two sitting together the father and husband in the old grey house end of chapter ninety five recording by jenny bradshaw end of women of history by anonymous